All right, welcome back to another Motor Week Retro Review Reaction, and this week it is the 1990 Infiniti Q45. This is a long time coming. This is a reaction video I should have done quite some time ago. I've had multiple requests for it, probably all of them from the same person, but they were absolutely right to request it. So welcome back to All Cars, y'all. I am John, and I did touch on this car before. One of my earlier, I think it was, reaction videos was a luxury car lineup from like 1991, 1992, something like that. And this car was part of that. I did not go back and rewatch that before I saw this, uh, before I recorded this. I have not watched this video yet, and um, I don't know where I ranked it. I do know that I didn't put it number one. Okay, and I've got two things to say before we jump into it. First off is, I'm gonna be very critical of this car, but please keep in mind, I really like this car, and I think that it was relatively close to changing the styling direction of luxury cars, if it had been more of a smashing success than it was. The other thing is that Infiniti and Lexus launched at approximately the same time. And when you had the two largest Japanese vehicle manufacturers designing a luxury brand, it wasn't set in stone that Toyota would win. We didn't know. Infiniti didn't know what Lexus was doing. So this had a legitimate chance of being a runaway success, at least in the United States but it wasn't. So it's hard to look back at Infinity's history and their lack of focus, their lack of keeping a focus and kind of wandering through the forest for the past 30 years when compared to Lexus. I'm gonna probably bring that up a lot during this video, so I just wanna say it up front, it's hard to do this in hindsight without comparing and contrasting the two, but let's get into it. Grab your favorite beverage of choice and uh, sit back and let's take that trip down memory lane. Motor Week is made possible by Rock Auto, Tire Rack, and Die Hard. Like a lot of snowbirds, we've come here to Phoenix, Arizona to escape the cold weather in the east. And what did we find in this great western outdoors but the new luxury import from Japan, the Infiniti Q45. And here it is, everything we expected. Now over here, guys, it really does exist, you know. But it seems that not everyone knows what the Infiniti models look like, thanks to all those early commercials that showed everything but the car. I'm, I'm sorry, I've got to interrupt, because that was something I was going to bring up, and they led with it, and I, they, brilliant, absolutely brilliant. I loved how they did it. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll go ahead and say it now, that Lexus kind of focused on the excellence of excellence. That's how I like to think about it. it. Being absolutely the best and sweating every detail. And ultimately, the LS ended up changing how established brands like BMW and Mercedes designed, marketed, and engineered their cars. It, 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 at least building to a price point, right? Infinity, when they were designing it, we'll talk more about the style in a little bit, they wanted to talk about the feelings of luxury. And so those early commercials showed like, I don't know, the mountains and clouds and ponds and fields of waving grain or whatever it happened to be and never actually showed the car. And ultimately it, it's pretty cool and probably they got, uh, probably they got some peer <laughs> celebrations of for their, their amazingness, but Ultimately, they were forced to change and start showing the car because people like, look at the car, come come drive it, right? Uh, so really, really good intro here. We'll talk about the styling in a second. Kind of makes you wonder if the folks at Infiniti had something to hide. Well, they don't anymore. Infiniti is eager to reveal the Q45 secrets without further delay. 
Visually, it's hard to decide what size class the Infiniti Q45 occupies. It looks awfully lean, and here's why. Though four inches longer than a Jaguar XJ6, it's seven inches narrower. And while the Infiniti Q45 looks much less bulky than the Lexus LS400, its wheelbase at 113.4 inches is about two and a half inches longer. I didn't know that. Did you? I had no idea that its wheelbase was longer than the LX. Uh, in that comparison to the Jaguar, that it's seven inches narrower. I know the Jaguar is wide, but I thought its bulk was hidden with styling. Um, apparently, no, it was just sm small, narrow. So, And that's partially because they took this they didn't design a chassis from the ground up. And this is a major problem that I think Infinity has. Their idea of creating American luxury is to kind of rummage around over here in the toy box and see what they have somewhere else. Uh, this was a Japanese market car that they, you know, put in the microwave and then sold over here. Um, I'm not saying it wasn't good. I'm just saying it wasn't designed from the get-go for our market. Now let's talk about the styling real quick because it's a mixed bag. I mean, it, they went with no grill. That's what I'm trying to dance around here. And at the time, in the late 80s, uh, 1990 here, that probably to the stylus was very futuristic. We later learned, and certainly the Honda Civic went without a grill for a while, that people like grills. And the Civic had to put a grill back in later on. And I think it hamstrung this car from the get-go. It's not unhandsome, but it looks a little awkward. And what they said about the dimensions explains why. It's long and narrow, and then you have no grill. It looks a little weird. But, but for a change of fate, I think this could have set the template because to design a car with no grill, you have to have excellent airflow and heat control for that engine. This shows engineering excellence in a lot of ways. I think it's lost on consumers, but if this had been a runaway success, I think this may have set the template for the next 10 to 15 years versus what we have now of these ever larger grills except on EVs. Side here, it's okay, it's a mix, right? This car seems unfocused to me. This is the overall word I have for this car is unfocused. And what they focused on felt kind of out of place with each other. So at the front, they looked like they were going for extremely modern and setting a trend with no grill. Down the side, it looks a little British to me. This looks a lot, a lot like some Rover side profiles, but then a lot of chrome around it, which could be Rover, could be UK, could be, could be Cadillac. It's okay, it's okay. But when we get here to the rear, this is where I tend to love the car, but also not, all right? It's a little chunky, so you know what I mean? I love the way they did the lights. I love it going across, and. I almost love everything about it, except the rear looks like a different car to me. And I mean that from a, when you look at the side profile in the rear of a Mercedes, a Cadillac, or the Lexus LS of the time period, they're more upright and stately. This, I'm not saying it looks like a Mustang or Camaro, but it looks more muscular. So at the front, you've almost got modernist art deco and at the back you've got almost muscle car so the q45 in a lot of ways was going more towards the bmw m series what was going to be the m series than stately luxury and unfortunately to me the front rear and the side all do not look like they were designed by the same team they look like three competing views of what Japanese luxury should be. If dimensions don't place it smack in the middle of the luxury import market, its price does, $38,800 even. 
There's only one major option package, and our car had it, which brings the price to $40,500. To put those numbers into perspective, the Lexus LS400 starts at $35,000, but has more options, while the Mercedes-Benz 300E will set you back $45,900. But the most impressive number of all comes from beneath the Q45's beautifully finished skin. Its 4.5 liter V8 engine generates 278 horsepower. It does that with four camshafts and four valves per cylinder. The engine also delivers 292 pound-feet of torque. But that number doesn't show itself until the engine is turning fairly fast at about 4,000 RPM. So really impressive, honestly. This engine is, I believe, really impressive. Um, there, there's a reason that, again, from the muscle car point of view here, this car was a success, but there's a reason that Infinity didn't do the commercials where you stacked up champagne glasses to show the smoothness. This is a smooth engine, but, and the numbers are pretty impressive, but that wasn't their focus, right? Their focus was more oomph. Good engine. That's what I'm trying to say here. Combine that characteristic with a transmission that starts itself out in second gear, and the Q45 feels a bit sluggish off the mark in around town driving. But if you choose first gear manually or push the throttle all the way to the floor from the start, the Q45 becomes a rocket. Ours went from 0 to 60 in an amazing 7.2 seconds. Quarter mile time was also very fast at 15.3 seconds, the finish line speed 93. As with most of its competition, the Q45 comes standard with anti-lock brakes, but this car has a difference. While most ABS units cause a lot of pulsation in the pedal during a panic stop, the Infinity brake pedal is more discreet. It tells you the ABS is operating by dipping a little closer to the floor. Overall braking performance is excellent. Our car needed only 108 feet on average to stop from 60 miles per hour. Wow. Um, so, uh, I'm going to rewind here. I want to show you something, and then we're going to talk about those numbers. All right, so the first thing is I want to talk about braking. Absolutely fantastic. If you've been watching any of these videos recently, you know I've kind of homed in on 115 feet being the number. If you're below that or you're at that, that's excellent braking. 108, that's pretty impressive. Quarter mile time here, fantastic. 7.20 to 60, fantastic. Starting in second gear so that your car feels lethargic, uh, I counter that. You're a doctor, you finished a long six hour shift at your orthopedic surgeon job, whatever, and you want a luxury ride home, start in second gear because you're probably just sitting in traffic. I don't have a problem with that because it kicks in when you need it. But I want you to look at this, look at me for a second. Forget what car you're seeing. Now I want you to glance at that screen and then back at me. What did you just look at? Because for all the world, that looks like a Crown Victoria to me. I've never thought of it before, but I swear to you that could be a police interceptor coming down the road. Now, I know on the side and on the rear and everything else, and when it gets closer, it's not. But dang, that really jumped out at me. Bridge to stop from 60 miles per hour. For handling, the Infiniti Q45 has a fully independent multi-link suspension with coil springs at all four wheels. In addition, our model had all-wheel steering, which is part of the Q45's option package. And the slalom, the car feels smaller than cars of its wheelbase generally do and we were surprised by its tendency towards tail happiness, the rear end's desire to beat the front end to the next pylon when the car is pushed to the limit. Steering has the firm feel we associate with German sedans and the quick response of smaller Japanese sedans. Inside, the Infinity reminds us of another... Go into the interior, because I'm gonna, I'm gonna have something to say about this. Um, very interesting. Overall, the performance stuff with the exception of the tail happiness they were talking about, but four-wheel steering, coils at every every corner. Uh, this car, in many ways, is a late 80s Japanese technological tour de force with a little bit of muscle car thrown in. And that's a 
that's going to be repeated later in Infinity's history. I'm going to have to do a retro review of the like the M37 at some point because that car was weird as heck, but super cool. Um, overall, you just get the impression this is such a competent car. But at no point is what they're saying making you think it's beating Mercedes or BMW in the overall package, the luxury performance mix. Let's look at the interior real quick. Japanese sedan, the Nissan Maxima, which is no surprise, the Infiniti also comes to us from Nissan. The dash has that clean, carved from a single block of plastic look that we've come to expect in Nissan products. Some of our staff members were a bit put off by this, expecting veneer accents and a rich look to fabrics as on other cars in this class. But the Q45 does have the expected driver's side airbag. Instrumentation is analog and easy to read, but there are no readouts for oil pressure or volts. Even so, drivers who appreciate sport equipment will like the left foot dead pedal. The Q45 sharply raked front pillar makes you crouch a bit to get in. Leather upholstered seats are inviting to the eye, but are very firm and lack thigh support. Seats are power adjusting, although only the driver's seat adjusts for height. The steering wheel both tilts and telescopes, and the front seat belts have adjustable upper mounting points for greater comfort. Cruise is standard, and all controls are large and well marked, though some are hidden by the steering wheel. If the wiper stock looks familiar, that's because it's the same one you'll find on a Nissan Maxima. Maybe we weren't supposed to notice. It's also hard to notice the switches for trunk and fuel door releases down under the armrest. Automatic temperature control is standard. It's easy to see, use, and reach, and it's a lot simpler than some of the systems in more expensive luxury cars. The audio system is nearby, a four-speaker Bose system with cassette deck. It has a good sound, and a trunk-mounted 10-disc Sony CD changer has just been made available. A sunroof is also standard, and it has a one-touch open feature. You don't have to hold the button. Another noteworthy feature is the automatic transmission shifter. Its smooth action and logical gait encourage driver involvement. As for rear passengers, they're treated to three-point rear belts and a rear seat cushion that's fairly long, if not soft. Taller passengers will find legroom limited. But there is room back here for the odd parcel or two. For larger items, the trunk opening is wide and liftover height is slightly higher than the bumper. Trunk room measures just short of 15 cubic feet, which is typical in this class. Okay, a lot to go over here. Trunk, absolutely fine. There's nothing wrong with 15 cubic feet. Back, back seat, if they're complaining that taller drivers are going to have a problem with rear seat legroom, how short was that dude? Okay, that was a lot of space in the rear. Um, that comment about the A-pillar means you might have to duck a little bit to get in. T tells me what I need to know about the styling of the car and how it's a little more swoopy and not that upright I talked about earlier. But overall, the dash. The problem here is that if you and I worked for Nissan Styling and we were designing this dash and we can convince ourselves it's a single piece so it's not going to rattle. It doesn't have 50 different pieces like the Americans. It's clear. The ergonomics are the most advanced we've got. We've made the buttons nice and big. We can save 10 cents by using the Maxima's, you know, stalk there. And we are matching what the most advanced are doing by putting the door, excuse me, the seat controls up on the door, whereas Cadillac's probably pull, still put them down on the seat like they did in the 70s. And we're trying to do a modernist, humanist, feel the luxury while also feeling the power. Interior, we don't need walnut and fabrics and everything else. I'm sure that you and I, in a bubble, would convince ourselves this interior is world class. But actually to see it, it's not. It looks like the, the materials are fine. It is high quality. It's well built. It's clear. The ergonomics are fine. But what you end up with is something that feels, for all the world, like an expensive 
really big Sentra. Honestly. Now, styling-wise, when you look at what GM was doing in the late 80s of square binnacles and lots of chrome, this is a revelation. But even compared to the Lexus, and the Lexus was boring inside because they also avoided the fabrics and the walnut and everything else, this looks dour. Now, luckily, those seats are a little gray, but still, the overall approach is black on black on black. Would it have killed them <laughs> to do a little fabric, do a little wood, do some... They could have made this interior spectacular, and they didn't, because they were going, I think, for more minimalistic. And this leads back to the unfocus of this car. The engineering, the structural rigidity, the idea is so good, and the execution of some finer details it really frustrates me. I hope you hear that, because this car could have been a home run. Atypical is the Q45's interior sound level. It measures a very quiet 65 decibels at 60. Amazing for a car with such a high performance potential. All in all, the Q45 is an effortless cruiser and the fuel economy isn't bad either. The Q45 is EPA rated at 16 city, 22 highway. We reported 18 in typical driving. Our list of Motor Week hits starts with the smooth, quiet V8 engine, spirited handling, and excellent anti-lock brakes. We also like its excellent finish quality and overall driver-oriented performance feel. On the other hand, the Q45 lacks the luxury appointments that are expected on cars in this class, wood on the dash, and controls that are specific to one model only. We also wish the Q45 had more rear legroom and better front seat thigh support. For comparison, the Lexus LS400 has a much more luxurious interior and a slightly lower base price. But the Toyota product is not as quick, nor does it match the Infiniti in handling. A Jaguar XJ6 cost about $1,000 more than the Infiniti. It offers a beautifully appointed interior and a smoother ride, but it lacks the Infiniti's handling prowess and V8 acceleration. What the Infiniti Q45 lacks most of all is the heritage that automatically comes with well-established luxury cars. But with all it's got going for it, it won't be anonymous for long and will quickly establish a notable heritage of its own. I don't know how the Infiniti Q45 did. I know it was not what the Lexus LX, LS was. Um, I don't think it did terrible. I just don't think it did great. And it's very easy to look back on a car and be like, oh, how did they decide that? But it's harder when you're in the 80s and you're looking towards the 90s and like, where is the automotive market going to be? Especially when we're launching not just another car, but a whole new brand. We're moving up market. We're trying to become a luxury brand. What do people want? And how can we compete with Mercedes and BMW well, Cadillac was honestly at the time still the, the elephant in the room. Infinity came so close. And if someone, if we were in 1990, 1991, and we were standing there and there was an Infinity Q45 and a Lexus LS, and my doctor went, I want the Infinity, I wouldn't blame him at all. It's got the leather, it's got the appointments, it's got the build quality, and it's got a little bit more guts to it when you want to get away to the beach or to the mountains for the weekend. I respect that. But the individual pieces, and I've become more critical of this car as I've gotten older, and I've come to appreciate the LS more as I've gotten older as well, the LS's decisions make more and more sense as the years went by. Boring styling meant more classic. An engine not focused on horsepower and performance meant more smoothness. Lexus is, I think they're a little lost in the woods themselves right now relative to Mercedes and BMW and Tesla and everybody else, but they still build an excellently built product that I absolutely would be proud to own. I can't say that about Infinity. Infinity came to this game with the Q45 and what they ended up with was 
subjectively by the numbers, even the decibel readings, an excellent vehicle that I would argue is, I will argue is probably a better vehicle than the BMW, the Mercedes, Cadillac, Lincoln, Acura top of the line, Volvo, Saab, anybody else you can throw in there except for Lexus maybe. And that's a flavor thing. This was an excellent vehicle that was hamstrung with decisions made years before. The lack of a grill, I want to talk about that again. It was an aggressive move by them. It was a bold move by them and it didn't work. And one of the big downsides to me is that Lexus and Infiniti could not afford to launch three different products all developed from the ground up. Now, Lexus invested a lot more in their product when they brought it in. To a greater or lesser extent, Infiniti took an existing product and, and modified it for the American market. But then they pulled from their portfolios and brought in a mid and a low, right? The M class, for example. The was it the i30, I think, you know, for Infiniti, which looked for all the world like a Sentra, but it wasn't. But the not having a grill robbed Infiniti of a corporate identity because you couldn't take these other products, the M and the I, and put a family grill on it and tie it in with that top of the line car you just released. I think from the get-go, Infinity was hamstrung by decisions that meant they meant they couldn't form a corporate identity. Now, Lexus had the same problem. The LS didn't really look like the other cars they came out with, but they rectified it over time. Infinity never did. To me, anyway, all of their cars just look like they're randomly generated with a few touches to make them look like they might be part of Infinity. And certainly when you think about the M, series and the G series and the this series, it, nothing looked like it was vaguely related. And then this car, like I've said several times so far, you had the front end that looked like a modernist art deco, no grill. Down the side, it looked uh, vaguely European, but a little low. And then at the rear, it looked more muscular, more and, and then the performance was the focus but they didn't really challenge the Europeans, at least the, the British, let's say, with interior accoutrement. I understand why this car wasn't a home run, because I think Infinity took a gigantic swing to redefine what luxury was going to be. Picking a little bit from Britain, a little bit from performance, a little bit from the serious interiors of, say, Mercedes, and putting it together in a platform that already existed. They didn't design from the ground up for the American market. It just ended up being that close. I'm not saying it was a hair's breadth away from being the best but it was not nearly as far away as sales numbers and the success of Infinity today would indicate. This was a really good car, and it was really good in spite of multiple little decisions that brought it to this melting pot. Car feels unfocused to me, but that doesn't mean it's not excellent. But I will say, I will end with this, Right now, today, in 2023, when I'm recording this, if you were to transport me back in time with a bag of cash to buy a Japanese luxury car, I'd go to the Lexus dealer. I'd rather have that smooth, excellent excellence than the extra little bit of performance the Infinity gives. Let me know your thoughts below, guys. I appreciate you being here.